Great, it's a pleasure to be here after being invited many times and not be able to make it. So fortunately, the fourth time is the charm. Um, and I'm invited to be here and share with you uh, some work. Um, while I'm probably primarily known for work in visualization, as Daphna alluded to, um, this is some work that came out of some projects focusing on data preparation and data wrangling and some of the ideas it gave us around uh, new approaches to creating interactive systems. And so my hope is you know, at least seed some ideas on ways that data mining technologies and user interface systems um, might come together in the future. Um, this is largely work done with my former, now graduated Stanford PhD student, Sean Candle, and our collaborator at UC Berkeley, uh, Joe Hellerstein, in databases. And so one of the motivating questions um, for the talk today uh, was the realization, first of all, that um, my software doesn't know what I'm trying to do. And it may be very well designed by designers who have a, a deep sense of what I'm trying to do, but the software itself lacks a model that might assist me in valuable ways. And so, of course, the follow-on question is, you know, what if it did? Um, as many of you know, this is not a new question. Um, you would be forgiven if you're already cringing in your seat thinking about examples like this, right? Where people have come up with systems that have some notional model of what you're trying to do and provide interactive assistance. So it's obviously a very interesting question of how we effectively design in this space. And so my inspiration actually starts with a much more modest set of goals, uh, things might, that perhaps might look a bit more like this. So for example, something that may not understand the complexity of what I'm trying to write, but still has some notion that I'm trying to write you know, grammatically correct English without typos and help me along the way. In this case, providing subtle interactive cues like green and red lines that help me along the way. Um, another source of inspiration is something that we use daily so much that we maybe even stop thinking about how much it helps us, which is things like autocomplete. So for example, you know, Google autocomplete search queries for us regularly, uh, based partially on what we've typed, but then also obviously on a large corpus of previous data. So including things like, you know, what have uh, previous folks uh, searched for and using that to help surface interesting suggestions. So for example, when I was trying to learn more about this particular workshop, I can look at things like type in KDD IDEA, and it might you know, be interested in things such as you know, the registration or accepted papers from different versions of this conference. I might be also interested in the organizers of this particular workshop. So for example, you know, who is this Polo Chow person I keep hearing about? Uh, turns out he's an academic. Um, I might be interested, I feel like you know, I have access to his papers without having to type that, whether it's through Google Scholar or DBLP. But I think an interesting aspect of these systems as well is they open us up to serendipitous discovery, something we certainly want to support in many exploratory analytics environments as well. But I saw this and I have no idea what a polo shoe is. I don't even know if I pronounced that correctly. But it turns out it's a pretty cool looking kind of shoe. Um, so polo, I recommend that you check this out. Um, you know, buy them for all your students or what have you. Um, I know you like to name projects after yourself. Now you can have the shoes too. Um, but along the way, they, these, like, you know, hopefully these things help us complete our tasks more quickly, but more seriously may also help us discover goals that are latent. Maybe there are intentions we haven't even formulated yet, but systems may help us um, you know, explore more broadly. So that's kind of the basic idea. Um, so let's just look at a schematic of how something as simple as Google autocomplete works. So this is a search engine query. Obviously, we start by typing into a text box. We should get an immediate interactive response. So we know the system is responding to us, which may just be our characters initially appearing in that text box. But then it's going to kick off a set of predictions, right? So in this case, it's you know, some query is going to run. A set of um, autocomplete predictions will come back. They'll be ranked and they'll be presented. And then the user can select among them or decide that none of them are what they want and continue to type or make other edits. And so this is kind of a, a macro pattern that we'll see repeated later in the talk, what we call the guide decide loop. So for example, initially I provide some input into the system, which this is the user providing guidance to an automated system to search through possible completions, and then the user will select among potential alternatives. So this deciding whether the decision is to accept a recommendation or to take an alternative path altogether. For example, type something else. Um, so this is one way we can start to think about predictive systems, but again, this example is very simple. One of the reasons it's so simple, certainly from an interactive standpoint, is that the input and out domain are the same. So I'm writing text and getting suggestions that are completions in text. And so the interaction model feels very natural because there's not much that has to be done. But we can start to ask questions like, are there extrapolations of this model that work across more complex domains where those input output domains may be actually quite different in nature? Um, and so part of the talk today is to explore that question. 
Um, so here's some of the objectives. I work primarily in data, so that's things like data cleaning, data visualization, analysis, et cetera. So some of the things I would like these partially automated interactive systems to do for us is one, accelerate successful task completion. So we get our job done effectively and ideally more quickly. Uh, ways that scale to large data or enable batch repetition. So once I figured something out, I might be able to repeat that process over thousands or millions of elements. I also want to support discovery. I'm going to come into tasks with only a partial understanding of what I'm trying to do. And so I'd like to support some ambiguous intent as well. And finally, we want these systems to get better over time. As more and more people use them, ideally they should get better at supporting these objectives. So this long-term learning and data mining is important as well. And so the strategy that we've been exploring in our own work is um, modeling um, the process of what a user will do with an app uh, through domain-specific languages. So we're going to borrow some ideas from programming languages as well. So we're actually going to model the space of potential actions so that the system can reason about all the things the user might do in addition to the user just you know, clicking or dragging things in the display. And this might allow us to A, predict potential actions, and B, also provides a way, as I'll demonstrate later, of decoupling the user interface from the runtime, which allows us to do things like process data at much larger scales than what you would do in a standard interactive application. Um, and so to put some meat on these bones, I'm going to walk through two specific examples. The first is just really intended to illustrate the use of domain-specific languages to enable new types of user interfaces. And I'll pull an example from visualization with the popular commercial system Tableau. And then I'll move to some of our own research and later commercial work building tools for data transformation that combine this DSL approach with more predictive analytics to help guide the user process. And you'll see examples of the Data Wrangler project um, and our own software coming from our company Trifacta. Um, but first, I'll kind of jump to the end uh, to give you some motivation for why we're doing this. So why domain-specific language is an approach for coupling um, interaction with uh, predictive analytics. Um, so one, it will allow us to model the task as a program, um, often a sequence, which will allow us to rerun what the user did or maybe apply it at a larger scale. Um, it will provide us a formalism for reasoning about actions so we can enumerate rank, et cetera, as part of our prediction process, the actual things the user would otherwise do themselves in the interface, and we can learn about them. Um, so it provides that means from learning from usage. We can collect statistics about these languages and, and how they're being applied. Um, and then because it's a program, is the output, not just the, the result of what someone did in interaction, we're actually under the hood generating a program. We can do this reapplication to new inputs. Um, and also, as a result, cross-compile to different runtimes. Um, so again, that's some of the reasons why technically we, we like this approach. So let's look at this first example in the realm of data visualization. Um, this was the, the popular tool, Tableau. Um, how many of you have seen Tableau or similar systems before? OK, so I don't have to belabor the point. This is great. But you have a data schema on the left with the, you know, columns that you can drag and drop into an interactive you know, set of shelves uh, that correspond to visual encodings. So here's someone's built out a sales dashboard that's breaking things down by product category and region. Um, and you can see the resulting small multiples chart. And I, of course, can drill down and elaborate further. So for example, I might take my customer segment field, drag it over to the uh, row shelf. Now I'm going to subdivide those rows further so I can see within each region the different um, customer segments and see the sales broken down in that way. Um, I want to look at another measure as well. So for example, I could take profit, drop it over here on the column shelves, and now I see in a concatenation of two views, um, sales and profit side by side. Uh, and this is just an interactive process. You're dragging and dropping. You know, we can kind of zoom in on the visual specification and display here. But what's happening underneath the hood is that based on these data types and how they're organized, um, there's actually inferring a program. So for example, there's operations being applied uh, between each of these different data fields. So for example, I might be looking at a cross product, a concatenation. So in this case, there's actually a concatenation of two things, which are then being crossed with category, and then a nesting of segment and region. Um, this is actually then inferring verbs that are used, in this case, to determine a program for laying out the display. It's also being used to translate this into a different language, in this case SQL, for example, inferring the contents of a group by clause. Um, so actually, this single visual specification is resulting in both a database query and a program for doing the visual encoding. In this case, you know, we're doing drag and drop, but it's actually being translated into this underlying domain-specific language. And this particular language is called VizQL, or at least that's how the Tableau folks have decided to market it. Um, and it has a set of set-based operators, as I mentioned, concatenation, cross-product, and nesting. So basically set-based operators that also have analogs in structured query language, SQL. Um, and these provide an algebra for this tabular form of visualization. Um, so we can take these statements, compile them into the visualization program, and into the database queries that provide the data that then feed that visualization. 
And so this case, what we're doing is doing drag and drop operations. So basically simple visual interactive operations, but actually authoring statements in this uh, well-designed programming language that's for this particular domain. Um, and so let's look at this you know, in a schematic form. One could imagine you know, just writing out code in this VizQL language to go um, from you know, nothing to uh, a visualization. But instead what we've done is taken that, you know, that plane or level of domain specific language and we map it to the level of visualization and interaction. So abusing the terminology of category theory, we can say that we're going to lift from the domain of DSL programming into the domain of visualization and interaction. So then people are providing this sort of programming authoring steps uh, through basic drag and drop. Um, and so at the end, we say we can then take that resulting visual specification, ground it down in an instance of a, you know, a program in that DSL, and then evaluate it to get the resulting uh, database query and visualization. And this allows us to write some interesting questions. So obviously, this is a much more usable system than writing programs directly. I think the success of these types of tools kind of speaks to that as well. But there's also interesting mismatches that might come up in the mappings between these different planes. So one natural question to ask here is like, is there an, actually an isomorphism uh, between these two different levels? Can what I express in the visual language, you know, does it cover the set of things I could express in the actual domain specific language? And so it turns out in this case, the answer is actually no. Uh, we're going to build a DSL, I should mention, as basically it's a functional composition of lift, what you can do in the interactive sphere and then ground. Um, and then we can see, you know, look at these different analyses of, of the language levels. So I might say, that, can I take the cross product of two ordinal variables? The answer is actually no. You will always get nesting is what's inferred by Tableau. Can I concatenate two categorical variables together to create other types of plots. That's expressible in the DSL, but not in the visual uh, level. And so we might have design trade-offs that arise as we think about working in this space. In this case, I think the decisions made were principled ones because they simplified the UI design, but at the cost of some expressivity in terms of what can create. So as we look through this, you know, design issues will arise throughout. This is just one in thinking about that mapping between the DSL level and uh, the visual interactive application level. And so I was using a Tableau as one example to get you thinking about this mapping between language levels and interactive operations. So while Tableau is one example, there are other tools um, in the space of both database tools and visualization tools that if you, um, you know, look under the hood, actually apply a very similar approach. Unsurprisingly, with database tools, SQL is oftentimes the DSL that's being targeted. Uh, within our own group, we've done other things for visual exploration and, and communication of data. So for example, Lyra is a tool my student Arvind Satcher Narayan wrote um, that actually uses a different visualization language, Vega, as an internal model to support direct manipulation interaction to craft visualizations. Um, roughly kind of uh, answering the question for us, you know, what would an Adobe Illustrator for data visualization look like? In this case, you know, similar to the Tableau example, people can drag and drop things or manipulate them, and you're actually changing an underlying program, which you could then you know, take, up, you know, take out and then rerun, for example, on new data uh, to create a similar visualization, but perhaps in a different context. Um, so it's mostly uh, provided as you know, backup to understand this mapping between these two layers. Now let's look at this applied with a predictive analytics in a different domain, and that's the one of data wrangling, or really preparation of data uh, to get it ready for downstream analysis. So I know many of you have probably struggled with this. Take a new data set and then get it ready uh, for analysis can often be an arduous and time-consuming task. Um, to learn more about this, uh, Sean, my former student, uh, myself and others, uh, ran a series of interviews some years ago. And here's a representative quote. I spend more than half of my time integrating, cleansing, and transforming data without doing any actual analysis. Most of the time, I'm lucky if I get to do any analysis at all. Um, and we actually got a lot of pushback when we shared this quote with others, um, not because they disagreed with it, but they thought that 50% was much too generous an estimate. Um, you know, for example, DJ Patil, who among other things, you know, uh, launched the data science group at LinkedIn, now works for the Obama White House, said in his experience it's something more like 80%. Um, and so we realized this would be about, you know, we started doing this work about five, six years ago, that this really was sort of the elephant in the room of data science work, that at the time it was what everyone was spending um, all of their effort on, but not really talking about. Um, it's since got a lot more attention. So for example, um, you know, unfailably, you know, uh, Big Data Borat helps us out here. You know, in data science, 80% of the time is spent preparing the data, and 20% of the time is spent complaining about that need to prepare that data. Um, and so I saw this, well, we, obviously there's been years of really important work in databases, statistics, and elsewhere on data cleaning, but clearly there was an interaction problem um, that wasn't being met, you know, if people are still spending all their time on this. Um, but there's also something valuable that's happening in this process as well. People are learning 
learning about their data. So how do we, you know, help this process along without, you know, losing what's valuable about it? Um, and this happens even with relatively clean data. So here's your, you know, if you're a U.S. citizen, here's your taxpayer dollars at work. Um, this is some housing crime data you could get from the Justice Department. Uh, this is perfectly Excel compatible, but go ahead and try and load this into R, Tableau, or a database. Obviously, it's going to break right away because you need to transform it into a format that those tools understand. And so dealing with some of these issues uh, with data preparation, trying to come up with a more interactive approach, led us on a whole string of research uh, that started uh, with Sean, Joe, and other colleagues' work on a system called Data Wrangler. So let me just jump in and give you a demo of the original research system we built for that, published at ACM Chi in, in 2011. So here's that same housing data I showed you before, um, shown in a tabular view. And we like to clean this up in a way that we could then import it into a database statistics or visualization tool. Um, and so while we could have a number of like, operations you might select from menus, we actually, through some design explorations, ended up with an approach that took a slightly different interaction paradigm, but incorporated uh, some level of predictive analytics. So for example, I might want to get rid of empty rows as a starting point. So go ahead and click row two, and I get an inference there, which is just, what can I do with that row? Well, I could delete it. Um, but in addition, we look at the contents of the row, see that it's empty, and infer, well, one could generalize from that. And the second suggestion here is to delete all empty rows. So I hit the down arrow, select that. Importantly, the visualization gives me feedback on what the effect of that operation will be. Um, if that looks about right, which in this case it does, I go ahead and hit enter, and that command is added to a transformation script there in the bottom left. I now notice I have metadata, basically column headers embedded in my data. So I can click that row, get some suggestions, one of which is to promote that row to a header. So I can go ahead and do that. Now I no longer need these remaining rows, so I can actually just delete by matching uh, on the specific content of that row, and that gets deleted. And now the most pressing issue that remains is to get these state names out. These are kind of buried in these descriptive um, labels, but I would like that state um, value to be a categorical variable in its own column. So to indicate my interest in that, I'll go ahead and select the text Alabama. In doing that, the system has guessed that I'm trying to do an extraction procedure. So you see Alabama in a new column. But I also see some problems here. Without even reading all the stuff on the left, I can see that Alaska is skipped. Um, Arkansas is being cut off. So clearly, the inference is not quite right. Turns out it's because the initial guess was just based on string indices. But you know, I don't even have to look at the left. I can just go ahead and select more, give some more examples, prune the space of possible inferences. And now I see that I'm pulling out the regular expression, you know, the words that come after the phrase in. Um, I see that it actually does what I want. I could page through more rows of the table and actually see that indeed uh, this is correct for this data set. So now I can go ahead and hit enter. Um, and I have these um, you know, state names out, but I still have a lot of missing values. And so as I'm doing this, you may have noticed some other aspects of the UI, including these type annotations. So here we've guessed that the year field is numerical. And uh, these little um, uh, divided bar charts up here are actually showing us the percentage of values that parse correctly and those that do not parse as numbers. So I can actually perform operations on those. Here I can see in gray the, the high percentage of missing values and get suggestions for those. Deletion, probably not the best suggestion to give first on the top here. We were still improving the research prototype. Uh, but you can see that the next suggestion is to fill that in. Um, so basically do interpolation, which for string data in this case is just copying up or down. So now I've filled in this table, and I just have a, a few things left to do. I could get rid of all things that don't parse here to get rid of these rows I don't need. But that could be a brittle transform. Sometimes in spreadsheets, people put things like footnotes for annotations. I wouldn't want to just automatically throw those out. Uh, so to be a bit more precise, I want to get rid of the rows that start with the text reported crime in. So I select that, and I see it's giving me some suggestions. Uh, but not quite the ones I want. Let me zoom out a little bit. And I actually have a bunch of other suggestions I can um, invoke up here. I can give it a little bit of a hint to say that I'm interested in deletions instead. And you see that it's now inferred a deletion query with the right predicate that I provided by example. So now I can go ahead and hit Enter. And now my data is in a state that I could actually go load this into another tool and get on with my work. Um, and you'll see that you know, my data is here. Maybe I'd like to export it. So I could do that and export it in common formats, you know, comma separated, tab separated, JSON, et cetera. And that's fine if my data set was small enough that I could load it into this browser-based application and do all the transformation there. But in many cases, my data is going to be much, much larger than I can fit in memory on a single machine or even let alone on disk. So instead, what we do is actually pull in a sample of data, engage in this interactive behavior, um, but then actually generate a program instead. So I actually have the script in the bottom left there, which is really just a pseudo natural text rendering of a program in a DSL that we've inferred from all these interactions. 
So similarly, I could actually then actually uh, cross-compile that to a different language. So here's the Python program that implements the transformation that I just demonstrated. And I could do this for a variety of other languages as well, including, for example, Spark or MapReduce jobs that you could run across you know, a Hadoop cluster, uh, which is uh, exactly what we do um, in the commercial instantiation of this at Trifecta. So this is one example of this like working interactively to infer a program, but in a way that is really being aided by um, um, uh, data-based predictions. So this was the, the Wrangler uh, project. I want to very briefly show you a demo of uh, the more modern version. Um, this is Trifacta Wrangler. Uh, Trifacta is a commercial company, and we sell um, you know, software for, for industry to help um, clean up their data. We also have a free version that you can download uh, for your own use. And one of the things that we've explored in addition to making this product ready is how we can better integrate visualization in this process as well. So here you see these automatically generated histograms for every column of the data table. And so one of the things I could do is if I wanted to inspect this data more carefully, I can actually get column-specific visualizations with even more information. So in this case, we're actually looking at data from the Federal Elections Commission. So this is all the different expenditures and money raised by different political campaigns. And this particular data table is a table of all the political candidates. So of course, it has a primary key, and this is the candidate ID. And see, in this case, we've automatically generated summaries of the underlying data. And we see that most of it's valid. And in fact, we have a lot of unique values, which is exactly what we want for a primary key field. But these are, uh, we also notice an interesting outlier. So this is string value data, and for the most part, it's nine digit strings. We automatically compute histograms based on string length as a useful quality heuristic, and flag an outlier here, which is null. Now this is not the value null, this is the string N-U-L-L, -L, uh, which turns out was an error. This has been since been fixed by the FEC. But this can actually lead to really interesting downstream errors. So I initially used this data just with Tableau, and it automatically converted this into a null, and so then when you do a join against all the other data tables you care about, like expenditures, it will collapse all the null records with this one candidate, making it look like one secret candidate who lives in this Tony neighborhood of Connecticut is responsible for tens of millions of dollars of spending across the entire electoral map. And so I lost an hour of my life thinking I was cracking this big journalistic breakthrough uh, when in fact there was just a bad type coercion and a null that this type of predictive approach can actually catch for you right away. Um, so there's, you know, if I had done this first in my own tool, I might have saved an hour of my life. Um, but the fun doesn't stop there. We can look at other things like candidate name. And so similarly, we actually have an automated you know, visualization and outlier analysis. So I might actually want to just select all of the outliers that appear in this data set. And then, as before, as we saw in Wrangler, uh, the, the research version, we get automatic suggestions of the types of transformations you can do in response to interactive selections. So in this case, it's just to keep, you know, filter out to just the outlying values. And I do that, I, you know, I have a filtered data table, I can go back to the grid view and discover, you know, what are these uh, candidates with excessively long names? Um, so one includes Satan, Lord of the Underworld, His Majesty, Prince of Darkness, Registered Republican, um, Duke, Pont, Certificate, um, all sorts of strange things, Harry Potter references, and then Remo, the mini schnauzer, the cutest dog ever, who is a member of the dog party. Um, in case you're wondering, these are actual entries in the FEC database, so this, like, there has been some amount of either donation or campaign expenditure by each of these entities. Uh, for what purpose, I can't tell you, um, but I can tell you it's in the database. And so this is one of these things where, A, it might be data you want to remove prior to analysis, um, or it might actually spark an entirely new analysis where um, you might want to do an interesting you know, um, flavor piece on what's going on with the long tail of political campaign contributions. Um, in this case, let's get on with our own business. Uh, maybe we wanted to analyze things about the uh, presidential campaign. So we can continue on in this process and do things like, maybe I want to focus just on presidential candidates, not just you know, House and Senate. So I can pick P here, for example, get filtering suggestions. Um, turns out uh, money gets moved around uh, in advance of campaigns and even after campaigns have completed. So we can go into candidate status, for example, and take only current political candidates in this current congressional cycle. Add that to the script. Um, and now I have a much better filtered data set that features a number of the, uh, the cast of characters you recognize from the presidential primaries. Um, at this point, I might want to do other operations as well. So for example, I could go ahead and join this data with a different data set. So for example, maybe I want to um, link each candidate with their political action committees uh, that support them. So I can do that, you know, click this, it will then, um, if Wi-Fi willing, uh, load a preview of this data set, and then give me automatic suggestions of how these data could be joined together. 
So for example, here it's already figured out that the candidate ID keys in both um, uh, data tables are good matches, and I could then take a joined result, um, uh, whether it's inner join or outer joins, et cetera, uh, to build this out further. So in this way, there's a whole variety of uh, data transformation steps we could take. And at the end of this process, you know, if I had only worked with data that was automatically sampled, you know, I can go ahead and request that this job be run at scale and do things like ask it you know, for what type of output formats I want, or to compute statistical profiles over the entirety of the data, not just the sample I'm currently working with. And this way of trying to make this process of working with data just a little bit more fluid. So with that, let's go back into the slides. Um, I showed you the Data Wrangler program and a demo of Trifacta. I want to zoom out a bit and talk a bit uh, more about the interactive paradigm that we were exploring in these projects. So the, the previous version was like, you know, of how you would go about this is you'd write some code, um, you know, draft a transformation script, probably buggy because you need to iterate. So you'd run it on a small sample of your data. You might have to pull out manually through some other means. Then you go ahead and run it across your data and then visualization comes into play as you're trying to assess the results. Like, did it do what I think it should do? Were there any errors along the way? Um, and as you know, no doubt guess, what we're trying to explore here is inverting that paradigm. So instead, really starting with visual representations of the content, whether that's a data table or these inferred visualizations, being able to interact with those to indicate the patterns of interest to you, um, and then kick off you know, a search over the underlying domain-specific language. What are the possible transformations one could do in result? Enumerate those, rank them, and then provide back not just the, the code, but really um, visual ways of understanding what the effect of those transforms would be. So visualizing the output of running that um, inferred action on the data set. So then trying to really move the burden of specification from writing code into this more visual domain. Um, so with that, let me talk a little bit more about what's going on under the hood um, in these data transformation examples. So on the left here are actually the verbs, so the major commands that you can run in the Wrangle language. That's the name of our domain-specific language for data transformation. So things like taking text columns and splitting them, merging columns, filtering, writing formulas to derive new values, promoting values to metadata like the header, and other structural transforms like pivoting or creating aggregations or joining tables together. Um, and then we also have a set of possible parameters. So that might be a text selection within a cell or multiple cells, column selections, row selections, et cetera. These are actually designed to be largely orthogonal, that there's a set of parameter types, many of which are used across a variety of these operators. So we actually begin to systematically enumerate uh, different combinations of these things. Um, to make this a bit clearer, let's zoom in on one specific microcosm of the process, which is inferring text selection patterns. Uh, one, because it's smaller, so it's easier to bite off, but it's also illustrative of the, the larger process we use. Um, so it's kind of a mini language within a language that given selections of a text string, how do we infer, for example, regular expressions that then are good um, you know, like extractors for our data set. Um, and so here's a concrete example. This is actually from web advertising. So some of these impressions may be on a laptop. Some of them may be on a mobile display with various uh, configurations. So we're going to look at the log files that are coming back from this ad campaign. And an analyst wants to pull out the relevant data so that they can then you know, see what's happening, do exploratory analysis and build models. So in this case, they might do a text selection. In this case, they selected the text dynamic. You're really kind of pulling out a parameter of this particular log file entry. And here's a screen um, that, while correct, is something that you won't see in Trifacta, and that's this. Um, you might guess why we don't show this to users, even though these are all syntactically correct regular expressions. Um, so we, we did inference and resulted in these. And it turns out there are a number of problems here um, in terms of difficulties in both making sense of and inferring regular expressions that we tried to work around. Um, so I got you know, very down and dirty writing this module at Trifacta and got to re-experience all of my frustrations with regular expressions in general. Um, maybe some of you can read this and instantly know what it does. I'm going to wager that most of you don't. Um, so for those of you who don't remember, these things on the edges actually involve look behind and look ahead. So you're actually setting the context of what the pattern should match. And then that part in the middle there is actually kind of backwards. You're expressing what you don't want to match. And along the way, some of the, you know, the lovely things about regular expressions include that you have escaped literals in some cases, control characters in others, and this is inconsistent. Sometimes the literals need to be escaped, and sometimes the control characters need to be escaped, depending on what they do. Um, and so I think this is a wonderful example you know, in the study of like, the human computer interface problems in programming language design of a language that is clearly write once, read never. 
Um, and so as we thought about approaching this, A, we wanted you know, suggestions that come back that users can make sense of. But along the way of thinking through, that actually led us to a different language design that simplified the enumeration, ranking, and therefore inference process. Um, so for example, here's what you would see in Trifacta instead. You say, match all the text that occurs after, you know, in this case, the add source, and before an ampersand. And it turns out that is you know, isomorphic to the example I just showed you earlier, but one that not only is easier to read, also breaks up regular expressions into subcomponents that are easier to enumerate. Um, so this is what you would actually see in our product today. And the way that we arrive at this is you know, we have this set of prepositions. And so what we'll do is um, you know, figure out how can we express our expression using this mini language of prepositions. Um, and to do that, we have an inference procedure. And so we start, you know, the user selects their text. Um, maybe they'll give us multiple examples. First thing we'll do is process that text. Um, we might tokenize it or generalize it. In some cases, we'll hold on to the literal string. In other cases, we might generalize character classes to digits or letters, et cetera. We actually build out a whole hierarchy of interpretations of, of how we might process that particular selection and the text around it in some window. Um, we then can map that to all of these different prepositions. So we're going to generate a space of clauses, all of which are consistent with the input we receive from the user. We then take the next step, and for all of these individual clauses, combine all the compatible ones. So we're going to build out these more complex hypotheses based on these single preposition hypotheses. So really, in this case, building out multi-preposition expressions. Um, we then put it into a process that, you know, having been able to enumerate all of these things with appropriate constraints, uh, we then want to, you know, filter anything that results that no longer um, matches, maybe it violates something the user provided, um, and then we also want to rank them to give the best possible example. Um, now, I'm not going to go into the specifics of how we do ranking, in part because uh, our specific formulas are patent pending, um, but I will give you um, a general sense of how we approach it. We use both intrinsic and extrinsic measures, so we'll look, for example, at how complex, for some notion of complex, that suggestion is, um, but we'll also run it across the entirety of a sample and analyze the resulting distributions of matches. So for example, um, here's two results you might get if all you did was load this data table and select the word John in the first column. Both are valid depending on what your goal is. If you're interested in the prevalence of the name John, either as a first name or a surname, the result on the right is totally appropriate. If you're instead interested in doing a first name extractor, the result on the left is more appropriate. Um, so an interesting question is, like, without knowing that context of what the person is trying to do, which suggestion should be the better default? So go ahead and raise your hand if you think the suggestion on the left is a better default uh, to give to people. OK, uh, how many think the one on the right is a better default? So a much smaller set. And so you can hash out, I don't have the time now, among you why you picked your particular one. Um, but one argument you might be applying is like the one on the left is much more regular. So if I'm trying to do something that's, you know, on average is going to apply to the entirety of my data set in a predictable way, some notion of the spacing or regularity of results actually is something that people eyeball um, that also has, you know, be quantified in a direct way that feed into a ranking procedure. So we actually used a lot of the heuristics that we were applying kind of as human experts on why we preferred certain transforms and then turning those into heuristics that we could apply into, into ranking functions. And we build it out in that way. So that gives you some sense of how we go about this. We also have uh, various things that we weight uh, based on um, data that we gain from a corpus of use over time. And we use that not just at the text selection level, but we use a very uh, analogous process at the larger level of inferring entire transforms. So for example, you know, in this case for the full wrangle statement, the procedure is you know, the user makes selections, whether that's a text selection and we fill in <clears throat> a text selection parameter, or they select columns or rows, et cetera. We infer the parameter types in those sets. That might be a subroutine like we just saw for text selection. In other cases, it's very simple. Someone just selected a set of columns, for example. Um, we then generate all like transforms that are compatible with those parameter types, um, and then go through a similar ranking and clustering process. We also find all the transforms that produce identical output and collapse them and take our best guess as, as to which amongst that set um, is likely the, uh, the best output. And then, of course, we then present those um, um, ideally in a way that people understand, whether that's a natural language description or, as we find to be most effective in user studies, visualizing the effect of what that transform will be to allow people uh, to decide whether or not that's what they want to do to the data. Um, and so these are, you know, was one instance of a larger pattern uh, that we think can be applied elsewhere that we're calling predictive interaction. And this is really us trying to generalize from our experiences uh, building Wrangler and then uh, the trifecta systems. 
Um, so coming back to the schematics we saw before, you know, at the beginning of the talk, we saw this example of Google Autocomplete, where we remained in the same domain of text input and output, but involved you know, users going through this guide to side loop of working with these predictions. And we saw the example from Tableau of being able to use interactive visual languages as a shortcut and a more convenient way to actually fill out uh, domain-specific languages. And so what we're exploring with predictive interaction is really the combination of those two approaches. So we have the same uh, issue with a DSL at the bottom line. Um, and we lift, you know, we visualize it um, into an interactive domain. Um, in this case, you know, you know, we have interaction, you get an immediate response, maybe this, uh, the, the immediate result of your selection. And that kicks off a series of predictions, which in this case, we actually go down to the lower level, search over the space of possible language statements, you know, filter those, rank them, et cetera, surface them back as possible suggestions, which we can also visualize their effects. Um, and then the user can decide among them, uh, resulting perhaps in, you know, in, a, in a new statement that then um, is appended to the, their program that they're building out over time. Or they can you know, cancel that and go down a different interactive path uh, to find something that better suits their goals. So again, we see you know, at this, you know, this more complex pattern, the same pattern, though, of the guide to side loop, of that people getting, you know, providing input, which helps steer the recommendation system, um, and then getting back suggestions that they can choose among or um, reject entirely. And so, you know, you can see you know, by the reason that domain-specific languages help in this domain, it allows us to model the task. So in this case, you know, the data wrangling task can be captured in a concise way through this language, and it gives us this formal structure to reason about. But then it also allows us to produce programs that we can then translate uh, to other platforms to run at scale or reapply to new input. Like, for example, as new log files come in, the same transform can, of course, be rerun, or a visualization program can be reapplied. And so some of the necessary components uh, that we saw include, obviously, the content representations. In this case, that included tables and histograms, et cetera. But thinking about how do we take the information we want to work with, what are the appropriate visual interactive forms for surfacing that? Um, having a language model that we can then also combine with an inference method. And then, of course, closing the loop uh, with appropriate preview mechanisms. So given possible recommendations, how do we communicate those in the most effective way? And so this really is this interleaving of many HCI and visualization concerns uh, with appropriate you know, analytic techniques uh, to provide useful um, um, suggestions. Um, so there are many different considerations that will come into play. So obviously the DSL that has to be expressive enough to support the tasks at hand. How to know that you've achieved that is actually a very hard measure to pin down and typically comes through uh, in-depth engagement uh, with people who work in that domain, whether that's users, customers, et cetera. Alongside that, obviously, you need problem domain fit. Even something as simple as the choice of nouns and verbs in the language, let alone its structure, needs to be a good fit for how people think about their problem or at least can learn to think about it in a reasonable time frame. Um, what I found very useful is a small surface area, so the tighter the DSL and the more orthogonal the components of that, uh, the, not only is it easier for humans to read about, but it really helps to have that inference procedure be tractable. So if the space of potential language statements that are useful is too large, obviously this approach can break down. Um, and there's also the question of ranking. And what we did in most of our studies is that went in and actually hand-tuned things initially to get things that were useful straight out of the gate. But then the recommendations could get better and better over time as we got usage statistics that allow us to fine-tune various weights or explore and analyze the results of new features on our model. Um, and so how do you actually bootstrap this process, I think, is a really interesting one that is key to making these types of systems successful. Um, so I think, you know, to wrap up, there's a number of interesting research directions that lie at the intersection of multiple communities within computer science. Um, we've explored this in other domains. So, for example, we're looking at ways of doing predictive interaction approaches to exploratory data analysis. So, for example, our Voyager tool um, will automatically uh, provide an initial overview of a data set. So rather than you manually have to build out every possible histogram, we should, you know, it's simple enough that we should be able to do that automatically and allow you to have a breadth-based exploration of your data set. I very often see students get uh, fixated on a hypothesis that might be multivariate in nature and dive deep and miss out on fundamental like, uh, errors in the data set or distributions that are not what they thought they were because they overlook some of this basic exploration. So you want to encourage that, but also make it steerable. So once you see this initial view, you might indicate interest in particular data fields. Like this one's about movies, this data set. So maybe I want to know about how they're rated. So I give that, you know, I can look at some summary stats, indicate my interest in that field, and then get new suggestions. 
So in this case, summaries of that particular variable, but then also the search frontier I might take in my analysis, automatically recommending other visualizations that combine my selected field with other fields that might correlate with it or associate with it in interesting ways. And I could repeat this process as I might go deeper while still maintaining this sort of frontier of breadth. I can then you know, proceed in a more depth-oriented fashion with the rest of my results. I might see a chart of interest and then be able to things like automatically recommend alternative visual encodings, like these colors overlap, so perhaps a better result would be to see this broken out into a small multiples display where I get individual facets, in this case, uh, for each creative type. So the idea being, you know, this is just one example, how can this approach of predictive interaction where you have a back and forth between the user and the system making some automated recommendations be best crafted and applied and perhaps changed across different domains? So I think there's lots of opportunities and challenges to consider. I've alluded earlier to the problem like, you know, are there domains where the ambiguity of what people are trying to express is so high that inference is uh, uh, more intractable? It's an interesting thing that occur in some domains versus others. And also thinking about to what degree are, are users' intents ambiguous? Certainly in data transformation, we find that people have a sense of where they want their data table to be, but are very uncertain of how to get there. And so the transforms are actually very helpful, the recommendations, in helping them understand what is the right path through that potential search space of operations to get at a clean table. We can look at how this might apply in other domains. And there's also questions about mixed initiative interaction. So rather than always having recommendations in response to input, what happens when you start proactively giving recommendations? And I won't talk about it today, but we've done some research in this as well. And there's some very unintuitive things that come up in terms of how users respond. Like sometimes they'll ignore helpful interactions because they want to be in control and then pick them up later and then say, wow, it would have been great if the system had given that to me in the beginning. Um, and so there's interesting things that come about as people interact with these systems that might not be apparent if you purely took a data mining or machine learning um, perspective. And of course, there's all these ways these applications might break down in ways that we're not used to and might have higher development costs. These are all things that we have to think about. Um, I think one area that's particularly interesting that we could make uh, progress on right away is how we take some of these ideas and really techniques and methods from the KDD community and make them more a staple of uh, user interface toolkits. So for example, we might need uh, new tools to help design these languages, and perhaps even designers or people who are doing ethnography out in the field could help craft these domain-specific languages through appropriate tools. And then we can take that, you know, refine that into the formal structures from which we'll actually drive the user interface and perform inference. Um, and so thinking about how from like a language description, are there common types of patterns we might automatically synthesize? Um, but perhaps most interesting, I think, uh, to this community is thinking about how we can make it much easier uh, for people who aren't machine learning experts, for example, to build user interfaces that actually learn more effectively over time. So are there a common set of inference procedures that maybe not work for everything, but work on a common set of language structures that would actually be reusable in a toolkit fashion? Um, could you automatically, as you decide you know, what sort of content representations or widgets your UI should use, can you automatically synthesize the appropriate tracking to know this result was suggested, say, by this classifier, along with these other options, this is what the user selected, log all that data and have it automatically mined. So that instrumentation could be done automatically. Um, and then we can think about all the different ways that this might result in new interesting debugging needs as well. Like how do developers visualize and inspect these domain adapted language models over time? Um, and so again, these are just more speculative ideas, but they're things that I think that the intersections of these communities could really make headway on, on a way that might help usher in, you know, next generation of, you know, analytically augmented interactive experiences. Um, so with that, I'll just kind of repeat the overall objectives and strategy of this talk. We're trying to help people do more and more quickly in a repeatable way, and we're approaching how we can use a combination of uh, formal models of what users can do with the interface as a structure for them to provide inference and recommendation um, to maybe help them along their path. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for your time and also um, um, really um, um, note my collaborators, Sean Kendall and Joe Hellerstein, who are also instrumental uh, to this work. So thank you. So thank you, very interesting talk. You focus mostly on uh, non-numeric data, so text data. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can guess my question, which is, what about uh, numeric data? So sensor data, say, which yeah. has the same problem. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there's a number of things uh, that we do. So I mean, we do. I showed mostly um, like outlier detection on text, for example, and in fact, we do you know, common, it's easier for numerical data in the sense that you can build a histogram and do outliers there. Um, there's lots of things we do actually around um, a pluggable type system. So part of the things like, you know, not all numbers are the same thing. 
Um, and so actually having different types of recommendations on how you might standardize or transform things is one of the things like, for example, if there are temperatures, but they're pulled from uh, different sites that maybe use different scales or measurements, how do you I isolate those and help transform them? So standardization in a way that's being aided by these higher level types is something we've really looked at, um, as well as, of course, you know, having um, built in inference procedures that given values in a column, what are the potential types? And we'll suggest one automatically, but then users can go in and disambiguate that and that provides another you know, source of feedback for learning over time. Um, another issue, of course, is imputation when you have missing values. Um, so there's a whole kind of a bevy of numerical things that, that slot right in here. Um, I'm sure there's a whole bunch of things that you could come up with that we probably don't have support for yet. But if enough of our customers felt that pain, you could be sure that we would uh, roll it out. Hello. Can I ask you, uh, is it possible to add the logical constraints, like, for example, that you know, a person cannot have two fathers, or it's yeah. impossible to be at three places at the same time. You know, it can be quite complex. But is it possible to add the constraints so you can detect outliers or you know? Bad yeah, things? yeah. And so, I and mean, that's you know, it's certainly you could add that into the, to the rule system. So I mean, that's kind of that's pretty standard in, in the you know kind of data cleaning industry that you would have some kind of quality constraints or rules. Our current approach to that is actually like you can um, have custom types. Um, and so that might have some, some things about what the underlying physical type would be, but also certain integrity constraints that must be met. Uh, but one thing I would say along the way there is like probably in somewhat opposition to the classical kind of like data warehousing world was like no bad data can come in. It's really important for these tools that support analytics to be tolerant of error. So that, in that case, like we would flag those things as say, for example, a type violation but you would still be legal in the data set and then you could make decisions about do I want to go in and rectify that data in some form or do I want to maybe remove it and then go ahead and do kind of a, a quick and dirty analysis based on that. How the analyst wants to respond to those issues uh, can be varied and so uh, part of the important thing about the data model and the interaction model is that it has that flexibility baked in. I'm actually going to use my moderator privileges and squeeze in a quick question. Uh, so did you go back to this poor guy from, I think, 2012, the guy that was complaining about all his time being wasted and measured how fast he is now with this? What's that? Oh, what's the, oh yeah, so I, did, I kind of buried the lead maybe. And so with our customers, we're seeing, you know, we saw this in user studies as well, something at least like a 10x increase in people's productivity using these tools. We have people saying it's like the jobs that they've done in the past that maybe took weeks or months, they're able to do in the span of like, you know, less than a week, so a day or two. Last question. Yeah, so the, the talk was fascinating on, on many different levels. Thank you. I was struck at the end when you said uh, the, about the mixed initiative uh, yes. piece and when it, it presented the recommendation and, and maybe the, the user may have wanted to, to explore a bit. Uh, they, they, they didn't accept the recommendation initially. Uh, can, you, can you speak uh, about how you might circumvent that or, or why yeah, yeah. That, 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 that might have been that they rejected? Right, so one of the things that we did was we did a version called Proactive Wrangler, which basically had a model of what it thought a clean data table looked like. So basically one that's free of delimiters, kind of minimizes missing values. Um, really importantly, has homogeneous columns, so you don't have like union types or like kind of mixed type data. And then we look for moves in the search space that would actually get you closer to a result that looked more like that. So we just had an objective function and we just did like a local search that kind of moved towards that. Um, and then we could automatically generate some suggestions uh, to show before the user clicked anything. Um, and so some users like just, you know, for no reason were like change blind. So part of it was perceptual. Um, so that was interesting. But even when we know people actually scanned that and read them, they would tend to discard it. And, uh, and when exit interviews, some people gave us various reasons. Some would say, like, I wanted to be in control. Um, I wanted to explore a bit first. Or, you know, I've been burned by recommendations in the past. And so I just figured that they wouldn't be trustworthy. Um, and so I mean, that wasn't like consistent. So every user kind of had a different story. Um, and as I alluded to earlier, what was funny is that as people selected things, um, what we ended up doing is that we found like people then get into cold deception where they'd explore some idea and actually lose sight of actually what the most useful transform would be. So halfway through the study, we actually stopped it and then redesigned the system to explore a different variant, which is let's maintain some real estate to include proactive suggestions, even if they bear no relationship to what's being done in response to user input. And that's when people would say, like three steps in, like, oh, I want that transform. Oh, that's the right thing. Great. You should have shown that to me earlier, even though it was on like the first screen. 
Um, and so, so that was kind of interesting. But we found more generally, and this actually is something that occurs across both the psych and the HCI literature, is that different users tend to have different um, you know, ways of doing things. And so in our studies, we tended to have more computer science students with those, that background who tend to be more hands-on, like they wanted to tinker with the system, they wanted to see how it works, which in psychology language, we'd say they have a high like, external locus of control. Uh, or sorry, internal locus control. They want to be in control of the thing. Where there are other types of users who would be much happier. Like, oh, they don't want to break the thing. They want, you know, if, they, if I get a suggestion, I'll just follow it. And that creates biases that are actually countervailing, you know, in different ways. For some users, like, you need to, like, let them do what they want to do, but find other methods of trying to surface recommendations that fit their working style. Where others, you might have the problem that they'll fixate and trust the recommendations too much. And so how you actually, you know, gauge that and what type of user base, how varied they are, you know, is interesting HCI issues that I think are at the core of making these systems work that go beyond just, you know, what's the precision and recall of your, your particular recommender. Okay, and we're kind of out of time, so let's take the rest of the questions offline, and let's thank Jeff again. Thank you very much.